My name is Ken Beattie, and I'm just one of the enrichment lecturers with Oceania Fleet. Now today, I thought I would present a little bit about mummification. I found it very, very cool, but you know, I think perhaps, and it's believed by most, that mummification happened accidentally. Now, dehydration of human bodies, not just in Egypt in this particular case, but in Peru as well, occurred naturally as early as 2600 BCE. Now, you may not be familiar with the term BCE. It's just before common era or, or BC. Just there it is. So now during the fourth and fifth dynasty, this would be in Egypt. That's around 2613 to 2345 BCE. The practice became intentional. Now, we'll jump over to Peru just because I'm very keen on this particular part of the world as well. But the Chinchora mummies in Peru are 2,000 years older than the mummies that were found in Egypt. What's with that? Now, of course, mummification depended on the ability of the embalmers, of course, that's understandable, but also on the deceased's wealth and the status within the society. So, of course, the higher up you were, the better mummification process you got, the better sarcophagus, etc., etc. Now, the very best that we have found so far, um, the 18th and 20th dynasty in Egypt, is around 1570 to 1075 BC. Now, that's quite some time ago. So those are the best ones in Egypt so far. Now, the practice in Egypt continued on until the Roman era, era rather, which was about uh, 364 uh, common era or CE. So for quite some time. But we typically, when we think of mummies, we think of Egypt pyramids, etc, etc. Not necessarily the case, not necessarily at all. Now, just an overview. The entire process of mummification took about three months, 90 days thereabouts, um, with with a, an incredible raft of uh, various priests, etc., with different skills for embalming, a, a very, very detailed understanding of the human body, of course, uh, the anatomy, etc., as well as some religious, actually quite a bit, religious training. Now, the Egyptians themselves were, and, and I'm sure the Tinchoras as well, but the, the Egyptians were very familiar with how animals decayed, and of course they used animals for food, so they knew that the inside, uh, the, the internal organs, were much more moist than the outside. So with that information, they progressed towards the mummification, or the embalming, if you will, of the deceased person, and they removed all of the organs in the early days, except for the heart. They left the heart and had a very special, special meaning. It was embalmed also, and the, out, and the material that was taken out was embalmed. Now, this is kind of gross, but the first thing to re be removed was the brain. And how did they get to the brain? Well, they went through the nostrils. And I, I won't go into the whole thing, but anyway, they removed it. And once it was removed and taken away and preserved, the cavity that was left, some larger than others, I'm sure, uh, was packed with plant rosins and linen, etc., to, to kind of keep the shape of the head so it didn't collapse. Now, in, in later years, the internal organs that were taken out uh, were placed back into the body cavity. They were embalmed or preserved and then put back in, but they weren't put in the canopic jars. In the early days, they would enter the canopic jars. Now, you've probably seen pictures of these, or maybe you've been to Egypt and actually seen uh, canopic jars. There's one as a jackal, one as a baboon, and on it goes. And each, each of the four um, um, containers, the jars, contain a specific, the lungs, the, this, the, that, the other thing. So, but that, that didn't go on um, forever. Now, they were put back into the tombs, the canopic jars, but they were empty, so they were symbolic. That's just about it. Now, the next stage was to cover the body with a natron. Now, a natron is a, a very strong salt, a saline that's uh, indigenous to the Sahara Desert. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So they were, it was packed all over and inside the body to dry it out. Now, in time, the body 
actually kind of resembled, it suggested, beef jerky, dry, sinewy, etc., etc. And the cavity of the corpse was filled with all kinds of material, uh, straw and linen bandages, to keep it uh, some semblance of shape, uh, so that it looked kind of humany. But basically, it was a great big human jerky. Now, the body was then wrapped in meters and meters and meters of linen. And linen, of course, was made from flax in Egypt as well as in Peru. Uh, and covered with unguents, and unguents basically are animal fats and perfumed oils mixed together, sort of like a paste, and plant rosins. Now, I have a, a number of uh, actually uh, colleagues who are Egyptologists, and they said this was a real problem for us because it, it hardened like, um, like toffee, or uh, it, it, it was like plastic on the outside, so they had to chip, 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 chip all the way through to get down to what they wanted to find uh, the mummy itself. So, uh, but it was there for a purpose, obviously, to preserve the body somehow, from the outer limits of the outer whatever. Anyway, it was done that way. So, and then there were several applications of these wrappings and a process with the, the rosins, etc. And quite often, uh, just before the last wrapping, uh, amulets and jewelry and um, religious significant uh, articles, I suppose we'd say, were wrapped and then it was covered up after that with the final wrapping. And they're often, uh, the mummies were often placed on a plank of wood now that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because they had to transport the body into the sarcophagus. So uh, even though it was dried out and like beef jerky, uh, it still could perhaps break or, you know, it was fragile. So it was put on a piece of wood and then the final wrappings went on after that. Now sometimes, depending on the wealth and the status, a mask would be put on before the final wrapping uh, to kind of resemble the deceased who's underneath. So, and also, you know, the likeness would be preserved for the afterlife as well. So all very interesting stuff. Now, it gets curiouser and curiouser for sure. Now, um, the, the uh, Museum of Natural History in Paris in around 1976, so the mid to late 70s, um, a Dr. Michel Lescott was working on Ramses the Great, the, the mummy of Ramses the Great. She was investigating, etc. Now that was, Ramses was around 12, 13, 12, 15, BCE, before Common Era, so fairly old. And so Dr. Uh, Balabanova continued in that work as well. Uh, so th th it was so interesting. What did they find deep inside these mummies? Um, they found cannabis, that's right, coca, and tobacco deep, deep inside the, the, you know, the mummy of Ramses. Now, FYI, cannabis, coca, and tobacco are plants of the New World, not of Egypt. How did they get there? Interesting. Now, the first mummy that they opened, or were investigating, etc., uh, comes from the Chinchora culture of South America, the very first mummy that people had actually found, or the, rather, we're going to say the oldest mummy comes from that. And now, Chinchora uh, culture in South America would be just the northern part of Chile and the southern part of Peru today. So in that region where they're finding and have uh, continued to find, found and continue to find uh, Chinchora mummies. And these are 2,000 years older than the oldest mummies found in Egypt. What's with that? Like that's 7,000 years difference. The oldest one that they found in the Chinchora area uh, died about 5050 BCE, 7,000 years before uh, anything, or ago, if you want to use that term as well. So now, now Dr. Balabanova, a very cool lady, uh, found samples, uh, uh, took samples rather, of intestinal tissue uh, uh, deep inside uh, Pharaoh Ramses, rather than using the external layers, because all the naysayers, oh, well, no, there was contamination over time, uh, the linen was this, blah, 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 at any rate, she went down inside and she examined actually seven in total mummies from roughly the same period. And that was about 1992 when she did that. And you know what she found? This is so cool. Cannabis, again. Coca, again. And tobacco. And they were laid down in the cellular structure just like the rings of a tree. Cool. I just think this is so amazing. So maybe you realize that those particular plants, they didn't come to uh, the old world, let alone to Egypt, until after Columbus. Like that's 2,700 years later. 
Hmm. So it kind of rules out the possibility, um, you know, of tobacco being uh, brought to Egypt before a Ramses. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, it's curiouser and curiouser and curiouser, as it was said. You know, new world cultures preceding the ancient Egyptians. Who knows? And that just about wraps it up for today, folks. Thanks for listening. Uh, you know, I look forward to sailing with you anytime, anywhere in the world. But maybe, just maybe, we'll make it to Egypt. Maybe we'll make it to Peru and we'll see some mummies as well. In the meantime, stay well, stay happy. And until next time, keep planning your next cruises. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>